OK, so good morning, uh, good afternoon. Uh, everybody, uh, welcome to the first uh, Eurigrid user workshop to our mini conference uh, today. The goal is to share results uh, that have been um, generated, uh, achieved uh, through the uh, access program. We will introduce that briefly uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and for today, we have selected uh, <clears throat> six presentations uh, from six user projects, uh, together with a short introduction, uh, as well as a yes, summary uh, and closing remarks. So during the next two hours and around uh, 20 minutes, uh, we will uh, go through the agenda. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, all the presentations will be shared afterwards. Um, so you will uh, get uh, informed uh, when they are available, as well as the uh, recording um, of the workshop today. So then please give me a few seconds to switch uh, to the first presentation. So uh, as said, we are before we start with the user presentations itself, we are um, providing uh, a brief overview about the Irigrid 2 project and its research infrastructure access activities. Uh, it will be done by, by myself, I'm uh, Thomas, the coordinator of uh, Irigrid from the Austrian Institute of Technology, together with the access manager, the research infrastructure access manager, uh, Emilio Rodriguez uh, from the Knalia. <clears throat> Good, so the main background for our work that we started uh, more than uh, yeah, for around uh, three and a half years uh, was that uh, we looked at the energy system not only on the electricity system, uh, but power system, but also a bit uh, broader on, um, uh, we call it smart energy systems. So we look at uh, multi-vector energy systems and always uh, when it comes to validation and testing, there is a gap uh, that we discovered. So we need uh, here a proper validation and testing methodologies. We are working uh, already since a quite long time uh, on that topic that shows this uh, slide. So we started more or less with our cooperation around uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, so in around 2005 with the DELAP Network of Excellence that become later on the DELAP Association. It's also one of the, our partners uh, uh, in the Irigrid project. Uh, and moreover, most of our Irigrid project members uh, are also part of the DELAP network. So that was the uh, more or less the starting point besides some other uh, projects. And uh, there the uh, focus was on networking of the R labs at that time and pre-standardization of testing methodologies. Then we moved uh, uh, on with the first research infrastructure project called, uh, that was called Derry. It was in the FP7 framework um, where we already provided access because the goal of this uh, project is to do uh, research on the infrastructure, improve uh, methodologies, uh, tools, uh, and uh, approaches in our case, mainly on related to testing of smart grids and energy systems and uh, DR, the integration of DR uh, units. And that started as, especially with the dairy project. Then we had Irigrid 1 and now uh, Irigrid 2. That will uh, end. Uh, the plan is, uh, uh, or the original plan was 2024 in September, but currently we are discussing to extend the project for at least uh, seven months to um, provide uh, more possibility for, for access. But that uh, we will show you uh, later on. This is a bit the history where we are coming. Uh, we are a consortium of 20 partners from 13 European uh, countries. It's a European program uh, where we work, uh, as said, on uh, validation and testing methodologies, for mainly on the system level, uh, covering uh, the power system, uh, but also uh, um, integrated energy systems, smart energy systems, uh, for example, uh, linked uh, uh, heat grids and um, uh, power systems. Uh, and uh, yeah, the core part of this project was the same for Irigrid and the dairy is the provision of access, the transnational access and the virtual access to our uh, laboratories. So here you can see a brief overview about the involved consortium members. So that's uh, mainly research and technology organizations, uh, universities, um, but also uh, industry, uh, industrial companies, uh, so manufacturers, uh, and also one uh, energy utility distribution grid operator from Europe uh, is also part uh, of the consortium. Uh, yeah, and uh, total funding 
it's also always uh, important for the, for the project and for the project members to have uh, enough budget to work on the topics. Uh, so we receive uh, around 10 million euro funding from the European uh, Commission in the Research Infrastructure Program in Horizon uh, 2020. So here, uh, a very brief overview, as said, this is a uh, kind of an integrating activity uh, in the research infrastructure program uh, where we are working on joint research activities uh, or uh, improving methodologies, uh, tools, uh, uh, testing approaches for smart energy systems. So our focus uh, uh, is on extended uh, and enhanced validation methodologies, the corresponding uh, extended uh, tools, uh, and to improve also our research infrastructure services. Besides that, we have the uh, access program that will be introduced by Emilio uh, right after my short introduction. And we are also working on uh, training activities. Uh, we have created a, a nice summary of scenarios and test cases. They uh, provided the basis for our work uh, for the improvement of the tools. And besides that, also we share links uh, and liaisons with uh, other associations, projects on European, but also on international level. For example, we are working uh, deeply together with the uh, inter, uh, International uh, Energy Agency, the uh, International Smart Grid Action Network, and there especially with the SURFM. Uh, this is an uh, international uh, laboratory uh, network. Good. Uh, Mario, please uh, stop your uh, your camera, please. We, we agreed that only the presenters uh, share the camera. Good, this is a brief overview. Uh, and now I hand over to Emilio, which introduces the access uh, program uh, and also that is tightly linked with our workshop today. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, just a few words uh, also from my side because the agenda is quite quite tight. OK, I, I, I could start just saying that the Grid 2.0 is not a conventional research and development European project. Uh, here in Grid 2.0, the, the, the core activity, the spirit of activity is the clearly is the provision of access to research infrastructure by, by us, by the Grid Consortium. This means that we have to open, and in fact, we are open our laboratories, our infrastructures, just for implementing uh, projects of external users, not only opening the, the labs, but also giving support to on-site support for, for the implementation of those facilities. So this is the spirit of the lab, and this is the main activity. As Thomas has just mentioned, there are other activities that somehow are giving support to this core activity of the access, these joint research activities and networking activities and so on, like, for example, developing methodologies for a better specification of experiments, so by automating measurement mechanism, uh, procedures or by developing middleware and communication infrastructures for better integration of laboratories performing single experiments and so on. All these activities, very important also in, in, in Erigrid 2.0, are given, are, are, are developed for a better support of the laboratory access, basically. That's one of the of the ideas. Of course, it's a European project, uh, clearly, so we are mainly oriented to European researchers, or in other words, researchers coming from European organizations, but it's also important to emphasize that also part of the access is also provided to researchers coming from non-EU or associated countries organizations. It's something like 20% uh, of the access, which roughly speaking, 340 access days also. So it's a quite an, an important and remarkable part of the access. And uh, also uh, just saying that in this, uh, uh, also in, in Ergate 2.0, in addition to the physical laboratory access, we are providing a quite new also service, which is this so-called virtual access services, which is basically the provision of some online services some simulations that are online or some data repositories that can 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 get uh, let's say access also online with no need of administrative issues 
and and so on. So this is something that is is new in this in this project. Also, if we go to to next slide and coming back to the physical access uh, uh, to to the lab, just a few examples of the type of analysis that uh, and, and testing and validation that we are performing in the labs. Basically, yeah, evaluating uh, power system components, not only single components, also more complex configurations, up to let's say smart energy systems evaluation. For this, we provide co-simulations uh, uh, possibilities and real-time simulations and power hardware in the loop and, and so on. Certainly, this is the first uh, workshop and we are going to see a few examples of few samples of the many that we are having about the type of experiments that we can implement and in fact we are been implementing uh, in, through, through Erigrid 2.0. And just a final reminder from my side that this is the first a user workshop is as you, as you are, let's say, seeing an online event, but we will be having a second user workshop at the end of uh, Erigrid 2.0 uh, as part of the program of the final event of, of Erigrid 2.0 in Vienna at the end of next year or maybe mid-2025. So please stay tuned. Okay. Having having said that, uh, I think that we can move on to one of these examples, to one of these uh, samples that we are we are let's say uh, having as as beneficiaries of the project. Uh, the first presentation comes from a user group uh, from India, from uh, uh, is the, this so-called cyber test, cyber attack in PV systems for voltage regulation in distribution network is going to be presented by uh, uh, Sina uh, Javad from the Motilal Alomi, just to, yeah, just to say it, say it correctly. Okay, so the Motilal Nehru uh, Institute in Alalahabad in India. So please, Sima, if you can just share your presentation and starting the user presentation part. Hello, good morning, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Myself, Seema Yado, a research scholar from MNIT Allahabad, India. Uh, I want to take a few minutes to express my sincere gratitude to Amil and Thomas for their insightful presentation, which provided us with a comprehensive overview of Erigrid 2.0 and its research infrastructure assess activities. Their dedication to this workshop is truly commendable and we are fortunate to have them as part of our team. On this note, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Erigrid 2.0 consortium for creating and Sustaining such a remarkable platform for collaboration and learning, it's through initiative like Irrigate 2.0 that we can collectively push the boundaries of knowledge and innovation. Your commitment is instrumental in making this consortium is a uh, success, and I'm truly honored to be part of this vibrant community. <laughs> oh, I forgot to share my PPT. Yes, please, Shima. Yes, share it. Yes, no problem. Okay. I also want to take a moment to express my appreciation to the VTT team, especially Ms. Petra, your warm hospitality and the invaluable resources you have generously provided have immensely enriched our experience during our collaboration. This partnership has not only facilitated our work, but has also strengthened the bonds between our teams, making us more effective in achieving our common goals. Last but certainly not least, I'd like to offer my heartfelt gratitude to my professors, uh, Professor Nand Kishore and Shubhi Purva, ma'am. Their unwavering support and guidance have been a beacon throughout this journey. Their expertise and mentorship have been indispensable in shaping our efforts and pushing us to achieve excellence. Now let's move towards our presentation. I made my project proposal on cyber attack in PV system for voltage regulation in distribution network. This is called cyber test. 
uh, though due to the limitation of time, we were restricted uh, our work for transmission network, which was available in software manual. I was fortunate to have I was fortunate to have Professor Nand Kishore and Professor Shubhi Purwar in my team. And uh, uh, so let's move towards our next slide. We are going we are going to discuss these few more few topics in our presentation. That's what is cyber physical attack, why attack construction not detection and mitigation. Switching attack based on stable Lyapunov functions, that is switching at, uh, instance, indirect attack, and the study that, that carried out in VTT lab. Switching attack construction. Um, first, first and foremost, it is important to uh, understand what is cyber physical attack. A cyber physical attack in power system is a sophisticated and potentially devastating form of attack that targets the interconnected system and technology that manage and control the generation, distribution, and monitoring of electrical power. These attacks involve a combination of cyber attacks on computer-based control systems and physical consequences on the power infrastructure. So we can see that using cyber infrastructure, we are uh, the intruder will affect the physical infrastructure like circuit breakers, excitation system, and governance system as I have studied through this project. Our next point is why attack construction, not detection and mitigation technique uh, was focused in during this project. So uh, as we know, prevention is more cost effective. So we have more, we were more focused on uh, learning how the attacks can be constructed uh, more than uh, detection and uh, mitigation technique. So cyber security is often more cost effective when you invest in preventive measures upfront. It is typically less expensive to establish strong security practices, protocols and technologies than it is to recover from cyber attack or data breach. Mitigation efforts can be resource intensive, particularly if the damage is extensive. So it's better to understand how the attacks will affect our system. Switching attack construction. Uh, my study was basically uh, on switching attack construction technique that uh, is more or less variable structure theory. I have used IEEE 9 bus transmission system uh, for my study purpose. In this uh, system, the theory was based on variable system, variable structure system. The variable structure system is nothing but a very renowned theory, according to which a discontinuous nonlinear system of the form where is the state vector is the time variable and a piecewise continuous function. Due to the piecewise continuity of these systems, they behave like a different continuous nonlinear system in different reason for their state space. So in short, we can say that the uh, variable structure theory is can be used to controlling any system uh, to make any unstable system to a stable system. So my uh, proposal is to why not make this uh, any stable system into a unstable system. So I'm going to use a, a uh, I'm going to make a system that is stable initially operating uh, the initial con in initial condition that is stable using the variable structure theory and the Lyapunov function I will make the system unstable and uh, will also study related to uh, its its consequences so for uh, variable for switching attack construction there's two important thing first is the design of sliding surface and second one is the attack start time and attack stop time. The sliding surface which I have designed is uh, shown in the figure by, uh, by the equation SX equal to C1 del plus C2 omega in figure two, where C1 and C2 are the constants chosen by the intruder. 
and delta and omega is the power system variables that is the rotor angle and rotor frequency of the power system at operating at normal operating condition so i have chosen a normal stable sliding surface to make the system unstable my second point is how to calculate the start and stop time of attack uh, for the attack construction this is the most important thing uh, we have to choose the wisely the start time and stop time of attack construction that we can choose uh, using the overlapping phase portrait where overlapping phase portrait is nothing but it is the <coughs> sorry Uh, it is the relation between rotor angle and it is the graphical representation of the rotor angle and rotor frequency as shown in the figure 3a so we will choose a start time where the interaction of the these two sub system okay the these sub system are nothing but okay for attack we are using uh, we are implementing our attack on circuit breaker excitation system and governor system so we can operate our circuit breaker in either on or off condition when we are operating a circuit breaker in off condition as in shown in figure 2 then it will be called sub system 1 and when we will operate our circuit breaker in off condition then it will be called sub system 2 so we will get to the uh, system trajectory from these uh, from these experimental results and we can uh, we will able to create overlapping phase portrait as shown in figure 3a so from the interaction of uh, sub system 1 sub system 2 and the uh, and the sliding surface which i have mentioned in the last slide we can find the start time of the attack and the stop time we can find by the point at which the trajectory moves toward infinity we will stop the attack when the trajectory of the system will move towards infinity it is very important if we will will we will not stop the attack at the right time then the system will became stable again so it is very important to avoid hysteresis loss and instability uh, sorry stability uh, to choose start and stop time very wisely the switching signal is shown in figure uh, 3b obtained from this uh, experimental results this is the switching attack construction for combined attack here i am saying combined attack because uh, we try to implement attack on the uh, circuit breaker excite uh, circuit breaker alone and circuit breaker with excitation system and then circuit breaker with governor system so we have uh, we have uh, we have uh made a, uh, we have made our architecture considering control system with a wide area network uh, and there is some firewall router lan connection rtu that is present in power system so we are going to manipulate the switching logic as shown in the figure uh, figure 4b <coughs> sorry <coughs> we are going to manipulate the switching logic according to the intrusion design logic uh, which is based on uh, stable lyapunov theory so we will manipulate the switching logic and uh, change the status of the circuit breaker excitation system and governing system to make the system uh, according to the intruder design switching attack construction for combined attack which i have implemented in the vtt was basically based on uh, uh, in, uh, we tried to imitate the intruder behavior so for that we have used rdds uh, with rs care install in a system and another system with uh, attack design uh, attack logic design in matlab which will act as a intruder so we have used tcp ip protocol to communicate between the rs cad draft and the rs cad and uh, and the intruders uh, switching logic 
so we can see in the figure 5b uh, what we basically do we have designed our uh, power grid model that is nine bus model in the rs cad draft and we have used rs uh, we have used listen on port command to create the uh, tcp ip protocol <coughs> Uh, that will act as the uh, that will act as a tcp server in rscad script and will also act as a tcp client in matlab so we will uh, so the intruder will able to communicate using tcp ip protocol uh, to the actual design system there are some results which i have obtained from this uh, through this project this is the initial attack analysis in initial attack analysis i try to choose some incorrect start point and uh, stop time to see the effect or to see the actual uh, actual importance of the switching logic so uh, i have intentionally chosen the incorrect start and stop time uh, and this <coughs> from result uh, from uh, that uh, we can see that in through results that we were uh, we were unsuccessful to create attack and the attack and the system further after some time it becomes stable when we have chosen incorrect start and stop time next we have uh, studied uh, through different scenario the first scenario was in a different start times but same attack duration in different attack time different start time we have tried to uh, construct attack on generator 1 generator 2 all the available generators in the nine bus model and uh, it uh, and i was able to successfully implement the switching logic and create the successful attack and in, uh, able to get the uh, intruder behavior in our system in scenario 2 i have chosen circuit break and in this combination i was also fortunate to get some good results in which i was able to create successful attack which we can see from the results in shown in figure 8 a b and c in figure 8 a i have uh, tried to implement attack on generator 3 and generator 1 in uh, further i have uh, i have used different combinations for attack construction there are some more results which is showing a uh, successful attack construction using circuit breaker and excitation system um so for the concluding remark i would like to add some point that switching cyber the switching cyber physical attack i have tried to explore through many scenarios attack construction depend on switching attack it is very important to choose wisely the switching instance the functionality of any device can be disrupted if dynamics match uh, here dynamics match is uh, is mentioned because uh, for circuit breaker circuit breaker has a faster dynamics and excitation system has a slower dynamics so it is very important during uh, switching sliding during sliding surface construction it is very important to consider the dynamics of the excitation system as well as the circuit breaker we have to match the dynamics of the excitation system so that the uh, will able to implement the switching instant at the right instant at the right time interval and this is a uh, the result it was conducted for circuit breaker excitation system and governor combination as a result a system designer need to think devise uh, think and devise and investigate switching attack to uh, to prevent such kind of attack in future these are the references which i have used in my studies and i'm also uh, i have also submitted 
two uh, journals uh, regarding this work and i'm hoping that those result will i will uh, have some good result from those uh, journals and thank you for this if you guys have any question then you guys can ask i'm sorry i was a little bit nervous yeah thank you thank you very much uh, sima for the for your work yes implemented it at uh, the intelligent energy test bed at pdt in finland next pictures by the way yeah, so in that yeah, thank okay. You. <laughs> okay thank you thank you so much time for 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 questions or comments to sima's work we have one uh, Emilio. Uh, ah, yes from andres uh, and i read the question and um, Sima, please uh, try to answer it, and then we will switch to the to the next presentation because we are a bit late in time. Yes. Uh, uh, so the question from Andres is in the face portray, which one is the subsystem one and which one is subsystem two? Oh, okay. Okay. In face portrait, if you guys are able to see this face portrait. Okay, the green one is the subsystem one representing the circuit breaker is closed and the blue one is the subsystem two representing circuit breaker when the circuit breaker is open and the black vertical lines, the black diagonal lines are the sliding surface and the mesenta line is the interaction between these two subsystems so representing different switching intervals. Okay, um, I was I able to answer the question. One other one, but but uh, please, uh, all the participants, please uh, ask all your questions in the Q and A uh, with the Q and A functionality. But um, we have one uh, here in the chat. I read it and then we go early to the next presentation. What kind of communication standards you are using? What kind of cyber attacks mitigating technology you are employing and which types of cyber attacks? Can you briefly answer that uh, three questions? Like my focus was more on uh, more on constructing the attack rather than the, the communication term. So I just used to imitate the whole process using the TCP IP protocol, not more focused on the IEC 6185450 protocol. So I was, I have just taken TCP IP protocol using listen on port command to just uh, for the packet exchange. Uh, and uh, my main focus was to implement the attack construction technique at the right interval, at the right time instant. So I was not more focused on the uh, communication side, but I have used TCP IP protocol using listen on port command, uh, and that is not very, uh, that is quite popular and we can use to interface uh, any two software using that. Many thanks uh, for the answers uh, and uh, let us switch uh, and uh, for your nice presentation and your work. Uh, let's move to the uh, to the second presentation, um, uh, which is uh, on the performance analysis of, of PV integration, integrated uh, in distribution networks. And the presentation is uh, given by Anju. Uh, she is from the uh, Mochel uh, Nehru National Institute of Technology. So please go ahead with your presentation and share your, your slides. Anil, can you hear us? Some technical problems. Cannot hear you, Anio. Can you, can you speak, please? Anio, can you hear us? 
No, uh, we cannot hear you. Hello. Ah, now it's working. So please go ahead and uh, share your presentation. Are you talking? We cannot hear you. Or well, maybe can can someone hear hear on you? No, no, we cannot hear on you. Ah, uh, now maybe a little bit, but very very low. Can you try again to speak or are you speaking? It disappeared now. Uh, best way is, to, I think I would suggest to, to switch to the third presenter and uh, in the meanwhile, we try to, to get Anu back. Uh, I hope this is fine. Do we have uh, Eduardo yeah. Uh, yeah. here? Hi. Eduardo, are you are you online? Yes, our our third presentation. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you can yeah. Okay. So our our third presentation uh, comes from Eduardo Vega from the University of Las Palmas Las Palmas de Gran Canaria here in Spain. Uh, is color power the acronym is wavelet transform based signal processing for the validation of power flow tracing approach. It is a uh, project that has been implemented in Italy at uh, the Distributed Energy Resources Test Facility at RSE. So, Eduardo, the floor is yours. Hi, hi all. Thank you very much for attending this workshop. I hope you can see the presentation. Yes, but, yes, we can see yeah. it. Okay, okay. So, I try to introduce the work carried out by the energy and sustainability division into the into the systems power and energy group at the University of Glasgow and into the University of Applied Microelectronics at the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria within the project Solar Power and making use of the uh, distributed energy energy resources test facility at uh, Milan from RSC. When Professor Janus Bialek uh, introduced his uh, proportional sharing principle in his journal paper, Tracing the Flow of Electricity, he said that as it is impossible to dye the incoming flows and check the color of the flows, the proportional sharing principle can be neither proved nor disproved. Um, well, our team is interested in uh, enabling a peer to peer energy trading environment. And for us, uh, the power flow tracing is a key part. So, as this has never been proved nor disproved, we found it. Would be interesting to try to uh, dye the flow of electricity. So um, we designed a set of experiments to uh, try to prove this as we uh, thought this could be relevant for for the power flow tracing problem. So yeah, the main application of uh, power flow tracing technique is found on solving the loss allocation problem we cope with the who should pay for the losses question. Um, this has been relevant so far for transmission networks, but as I've already mentioned, the engagement of consumers in energy markets and um, make this uh, relevant again. During our two-week transnational access, 
at RST facilities, we carried out uh, 183 experiments and over five different network configurations with different sorts of disturbances. And we were capable of gathering high resolution and accurate records of distorted waveforms. Then, um, well, we have to say that the tests were required to meet some criteria. And at this point, I'd like to thank again the staff at the Research Center for being helpful at identifying alternatives and solutions when things didn't work as, as expected. Well, after our stay in the facilities, we have uh, subsequent analysis of the data recorded by means of signal processing techniques. And this is the script of the uh, presentation. And I'll go ahead. Well, as uh, I've already mentioned, most power flow tracing methods rely on the and on the proportional sharing principle, which deals with how the flows are distributed in a mesh network. And this principle assumes that uh, the nodes in the network act as perfect mixes of incoming flows, and then they are proportionally shared among the node allowed flows. Uh, in other words, yeah. we could say that each megabat leaving the node contains the same proportion of the inflows as the total nodal flow. The proportional sharing assumption could be intuitively accepted for the allocation cost, which are proportional to the flow value, for instance, the usage of a set, but uh, it might be argumented if appropriate for the allocation of components which are non proportional to the flow value, uh, like, for instance, the losses through line. So, well, uh, for our experiment, the mesh network and the whole active power distribution network was simplified and limited to two branches with uh, generators connected in parallel and with two other branches with loads. And the figure somehow represents the layout and the concept of the test with the dying of incoming flows. The idea is induce a non stationary perturbance in one of the generator branches. And it is assumed that any current component on the same frequency uh, detected on the branches on the, by the load side somehow uh, will have the share uh, from what well, will help us get the share of the of the power coming from that branch. Yeah. Uh, this figure uh, shows a synoptic of uh, RST test facility. It consists of a boost bar connected to the grid and a wide variety of generators, including inverter passive generators, different storage systems and loads, uh, also electronic loads which can manage to have a nonlinear behavior. Uh, and a set of switches and breakers provide flexibility to manage the network with different configurations and different roles. All the tests carried out uh, were driven from a control room equipped with a LabVIEW based SCADA, capable of operating switches, accessing remotely to all elements in the network, communicating with the instruments installed in most of the devices, and interfacing remotely with the hardware analyzer. Already said that we did over 180 tests. Uh, we, for our 2000, uh, 2000 to load scheme, we make use of synchronous generators, asynchronous generators, inverted basic resources, uh, the electricity grid. And by the load side, we use uh, a resistive load in parallel with an electronic load with different weighted power factors and uh, weighted power. 
in Aleppo was capable of gathering uh, 50,000 values each time. So depending on the number of tickles we were interested in capturing, the sample the speed we used varied from 250 to 500,000 samples per second. And well, this picture shows um, that well, as the facility, the facility is not intended, was not intended for this kind of test. So uh, we wanted all measurements to be closed, so there won't be any voltage or voltage difference. And we could base the test on the current. Uh, it was required to connect the probes of the analyzer directly into the electrical cabinet. And well, at this stage, again, we found that the personnel of RSC was always willing to help us to succeed in our experiment. So thanks again. This slide presents the different sets of configurations. Uh, we kept uh, the same scheme for the loads, and we changed the, the sources with uh, of yeah, inverter battery generators, synchronous, asynchronous, the grid. Well, working in different with different roles. Sometimes one has a grid forming uh, generator, and the other has the, the grid following. So yes, we this provides with a lot of uh, data and help us run different different analysis. Well, uh, for the test to be valid, uh, measurements in all four branches have to be synchronized in time and must include the precise instant when the perturbance was injected. And we realized that the power analyzer had the possibility to manually trigger uh, the waveform capture. So, it, so the, our initial approach to the the experiment uh, wasn't feasible, so we have to find alternatives. The first one was to base the test on harmonics. Instead of uh, introducing the perturbance from the generator side, we programmed the electronic load to consume a percentage of the power into 16 harmonics or 7 harmonics. And yeah, this figure in in the slide shows the example when we introduce um, 30 percent fixing harmonic by the H and H load. And what we found was that it the by the generator side, the waveforms became highly distorted, and there were harmonics uh, the third, the fifth. 7th, 11th, 19th, 23rd. So it was uh, it was going. We we couldn't going to be able to get any valid result regarding the the share of the of the outflow from the generator. So we had to change our minds again and decide to. Based the perturbance in periodic load change in the H and H load. So we started having switching every 100 milliseconds from a consumption from 5 to 10 amperes. And well, the zooming of the waveform, so the precise moment when the load change, and well, instead of Tracing the perturbance in the source by the load side, we changed to trace the uh, how the sources provide for the for the for this mine. Well, uh, next came the data processing. Through this, we combined the pre preliminary analysis with the test during our stay, so we could confirm that we were gathering data for a later analysis. And well, 
what does the discrete wavelet perform? It uh, transforms the data on its components on different uh, frequency bands. There's a course approximation, a set of, uh, of different uh, frequency, and uh, the composition of the signal in, on, into different frequency bands. So the original signal is the adapt of all these signals. Uh, the detailed coefficient for each iterated high pass uh, filter uh, provides us with uh, the signals at each of the frequency bands. Well, here you can see how the when the perturbance occur, there are uh, changes on these detail detail signals, and yeah, here we can see with better resolution by the by, at all four branches, and yeah, we can have a slightly a slight recognition of the precise instant when the perturbance occur, and we have different amplitudes of the signal. Something that uh, called our attention was the fact that by the resistive load, where shouldn't be any change on, on the consumption at that time, there's also a recognizable event. So, yes, these are things that we've been studying. And, well, as a summary, and as we're running a bit of time, I'd like to say, well, I will introduce the, the digital, signal, digital signal processing technique to analyze the quality and to try to demonstrate the proportional sharing principle, what were the tests carried out. And, and well, what we found is that firstly, for a better assessment of the dynamic involving the non-stationary signal, uh, we have to make a initial stage to filter or to separate the the, yeah, the waveforms and do the analysis over a, a filter a filter signal. We also try other digital signal processing techniques such as uh, the Garbor and Stockwell transform. In fact, with Garbor Transform, we are obtaining a smooth uh, result, and well, we are working on the publication of this result. Um, the number of tests carried out and the amount of data gathered will serve us to assess the effect of the changing load on grid forming and grid following generators. So this uh, open new threats for research and also to evaluate the usage of this technique to for power quality analysis and microgrid. So again, we are grateful to the Eric Grid program for the granted access to this top tier facility. Yeah, we have equipment at our institutions, but not at the level of this research center. And moreover, what we are more grateful is with the support provided by the specialized personnel, which made things easier. And we found them always willing to help in proposing ideas on having the experiment. Uh, we are looking forward to collaborate with them in new projects. And indeed, we've already applied into the same consortium with RSC for two different Horizon Europe uh, projects. So, well, I'd like to encourage all researchers uh, struggling to get the experiment uh, and idea proof to apply for this kind of programs because, uh, yes, they are helpful and you can you can get it and enhance your, your research. So basically that's it. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to 
point to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for presenting your work uh, at RSE in Italy. From my point of view, it's a very original research, trying to die, as you have mentioned, trying to give some color to the different energy flows that we are that we are we, we can we can we can see in the system. It's not conventional at all, and yeah, we 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 have uh, those issues regarding how we could try to die the experiment. I I even had the chance, the opportunity once to speak about this project with uh, Professor Bialek. And well, he he was also a bit skeptical about what we could get from this. But, yeah, we are, we are working on it. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you so much. So I guess that we have some uh, some room for for questions or comments to Eduardo's work. So very please quick, do sp very yeah. quick one. We are still yeah. late in time. <laughs> Sorry for yeah. that. I need to look a bit on the timing. <laughs> Uh, any question? I don't see anyone in the uh, Q and A, and also not in the chat. Maybe a very brief one. Do you have any follow-up activities planned for your work? Well, if I have any uh, new activities, uh, well, there has been a, a problem to work this project uh, we started working with a team with the people from Glasgow and people from University of Las Palmas. I've already moved from Glasgow back to Las Palmas. So uh, there's also some funding problems to continue with this project, but uh, we have a lot of data gathered there and we are we want to improve the some of the some of the measurement and yeah the people from RSC has offered the possibility to do some things online so we don't have to move to the physically to the facility and yeah yeah we want to continue with this work but that's also the problem of combining the digital signal processing techniques in, with the uh, power system knowledge. So combining all of these uh, things and these topics make, uh, makes us struggle to continue with this. But yeah, yeah, this is something we are bearing in mind and we think it's um, absolutely relevant for the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading environment. Many thanks, Eduardo, for the nice work and the nice presentation. We need to move on. Uh, we uh, switching back to our second presentation, and we try it again. I hope that the audio system is now working. And uh, Anjo Yadav, uh, please uh, go ahead with your presentation about the performance analysis of PV integrated distribution networks. I hope that it's now working. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. And now I'm audible. Yep. Please go ahead and share your presentation and start okay, okay. with your so talk. Without losing more time, I will start the presentation. Did you share already? We cannot see your slides so far. Yeah, I am sharing my PPT. It's showing shared. We cannot see anything.
I don't know what they so, but it's showing sharing at my end. Okay, then I can share your presentation and. Yes, you can share my presentation. So I said again. Yes, yes, you can share. Yeah, and uh, please let me know when I move. I need to move forward for the. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, otherwise we are losing too much time. Sorry for that, but okay. we are really in a hurry and we are uh, spending too much time on that. Okay, so please go ahead. Okay, actually this is not my presentation. This is the first one. It's, it's the perfect, uh, Thomas. Yes. Yeah, that one, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. I am Manju Yadav, PhD scholar from MNIT Allahabad, India. Today I am here to deliver a presentation on the work done, Project 150, that is entitled as Performance Analysis of PV Integrated Distribution Network with Combination of Different Control Strategies and Communication Network, that is performed in VTT Technical Research Center, Finland. Next. The user group members of this project were me as leader, Professor Nan Kisor from Ostfold University College, Norway, and Professor Richa Negi from MNIT Allahabad, India. The duration of the visit of the lab is from one month from 25th September 2023 to 22 October 2023. The problem covered in the project is based on voltage regulation and distribution network using volt war and volt volt control. Next. The contents of the presentation are introduction, distribution network modeling and simulation platform used to perform the work. Then I will discuss the results obtained from real time voltage analysis based on without control, with control and with PHIL involved in the system. And at last conclusion and publication on this work will be discussed. Next. Introduction. As we all know that high amount of PV integration in the unbalanced low voltage distribution network may causes high voltage variation and power losses, etc. To overcome this voltage variation problem, here we apply volt war control, volt watt control, and the combination of both, both the control methods to analyze the PV output power while maintaining the voltage within the limits. Next. To model the system here, we used unbalanced IEEE 13, uh, 13 bus distribution network in which the PV is uh, placed in optimized three phases buses. And for simulation here, we use MATLAB and RSCAT. As shown in figure one, it shows the IEEE 37 bus distribution network with the uh, three phase PV placement locations and the uh, load. Ha and figure two represents the solar radiation profiles SR1 and SR2 uh, used for the analysis. Uh, as we can uh, see in figure 2, SR1 reaches as high as 1140 watt per meter square at 1230. That is responsible for the voltage violation that we discussed later. While uh, solar radiation SR2 has a peak of 1000 watt per meter square. Next. The figure 3 uh, represents the uh, test bed that is used to conduct the experiment. Uh, here we can see that the PVs are placed in bus 634, 671 and 680. Uh, and uh, PHIL is placed uh, on the con uh, bus 671 and 680 uh, operated at one bus at a time. That is the combination of PV emulator and power amplifier. We can perform the power flow uh, using real time simulator that is RTDS to check the voltage violation at a particular bus. If there is no violation, modulate active power and reactive power of each phase. But if violation is observed, then the voltage sensitivity coefficient estimation is performed and then modulate active and reactive power of each phase as uh, presented in figure 4. Figure 5 presented the volt war control and volt watt control characteristic that is uh, used to control active and reactive power of PV inverters. Next. Real time, uh, real time voltage analysis. So uh, uh, these results are shown for the uh, base load conditions. In Figure six, we can uh, see the voltage uh, of buses 634 and 671 when no control is applied on the PV inverters. 
for solar radiation 1 and solar radiation 2 as we can observe here that for solar radiation sr1 we can observe the violation in box uh, 634 that is near the grid while for uh, solar radiation sr2 there is no violation can be observed in uh, any of the buses and uh, when applying the volt wall control and volt watt control into the system for volt wall control the system uh, has uh, Uh, balance load at uh, the buses but for volt watt control we can observe the uh, under voltage at uh, bus 671 on phase uh, c because of the uh, power curtailment next the impact of volt wall control and volt watt control at 10% increment in the load uh, compared to the base load is represented in figure 9 Here we can observe that the uh, when we uh, increase the load, there the voltages are uh, under the limit and balanced. But uh, as the voltage uh, as the radiation increases at twelve thirty, there is the increase in the uh, voltages of phase A and C. While for phase B, there is a uh, drip or a small uh, uh, decrement at the uh, voltage at twelve thirty for phase B. Next. next uh, in the table 1 presents the power changes in the network for different load conditions that is the base load 5% 10% increment at all the buses minus 5% 10% increment at all load buses and 5% increment at bus 671 and 10% increment at 67 634 so here we uh, observe that after applying uh, that after applying the control the grid power supply to the network has increased and decrease with increase and decrease in the load and further the grid power supplied by a volt wall control remains lower as compared to the power supplied with volt wall control next next the voltage of, uh, analysis is performed for phil placement in the system at uh, one bus so the power supplied by phil at one of the buses is the 11.6 kilowatt that is very uh, less compared to the power supplied by the uh, pv inverters that are simulated in this system uh, at uh, another two buses that is 412.5 kilowatt so here we uh, check the impact of the phil when placed in bus 671 in uh, figure 10a and uh, when phil placed on 680 that is shown in 10b when no control is applied on the pv inverters next uh, figure 11 uh, in figure 11 the x axis represents the control methods that is the volt wall control and volt watt control and here uh, f n and m represents the buses near the grid far away from the grid and mid of the grid so here we Uh, here we observe that having a phil placed on bus 671 that is the mid gate with three phase load then the voltage margin uh, among the phases is closest at the uh, bus 634 while uh, this increases at bus 671 and 680 but when we apply the control method that is the volt wall control and volt wall control or their combination does not have any impact on the voltage status of any of the buses similarly when uh, phil is placed on 680 as indicated in figure 11b that uh, there uh, does not seem any effect any significant changes in the voltage status of bus 634 but for bus 671 and 680 their voltage uh, variation is uh, small reduced that is improved so hence it can be said that the placement of group control pv uh, or phil on bus 680 would be better than the uh, placement of phil at bus 671 next so now i would like to conclude my work uh, so from the results obtained we can conclude that the bus voltage regulated within the limit that is 0.95 per unit to 0.1.05 per unit for pv power generation and the over voltage up to 1.15 per unit is obtained only on bus 634 for very short time when no control is applied and when phil connected to one of the buses of the system then the obtained results verified that the proposed control approach able to reduce the voltage variation issue uh, on real time uh, solar radiation and uh, here two papers published on this work one is the uh, sci that is published in international transaction on electrical energy system entitled as 
performance analysis of world uh, volt, bus voltage in distribution network with high penetration of pv control via uh, data driven approach and second is the conference paper published in eurocon 2023 entitled as voltage profile improvement in distribution network under transient solar radiation conditions finally i uh, i just want to thank you irrigate 2.0 to provide me this opportunity to share my experience in this platform and btt team and rossi petra for her uh, guidance and support during the live visit and uh, thank you all of you all the members presented here for your time and patience thank you many thanks uh, anya and uh, great that now the uh, the audio system worked uh, so after a couple of technical uh, problems, uh, we finally managed also your presentation. Thank you to having here. Do we have a, a questions to Anya's uh, presentation? Uh, yes, we have one uh, from Javet. Uh, what, uh, uh, moment. Uh, what is uh, PHIL and how it uh, its placements changes the voltage in the network? Can you briefly answer that question? Okay, PHIL is the power hardware in the loop that is a PV emulator and uh, that is the combination of a PV emulator and power amplifier which we can use as a, a real uh, PV system to supply the PV power to the system at any bus of the system and here the PV uh, PHIL is placed at uh, uh, only one of the buses because we have uh, only one PHIL active at that time. Many thanks. Uh, since we are already late, there is no, no other question. Since we are already a bit late uh, with the agenda, I would suggest uh, thank you, Anju, uh, again for your presentation. Uh, since we are a bit late uh, in the uh, in this uh, agenda, I would suggest, uh, I hope it's not a big issue, that we skip the coffee break and immediately uh, switch to the uh, next presentation from Manuel Villarreal uh, from the uh, University of Seville. And he will uh, talk about uh, power hard in the loop testing of single phase grid forming uh, what, um, what generators in grid connected mode. So uh, Manuel, uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead uh, with the sharing of your slides. And your talk. Yeah. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. And we can now also see your presentation. Okay. So, can you hear me? Thomas? Yes, Manuel. Yes. yes. Okay, very yes. well. Right. Okay. Good. So, uh, first of all, uh, thanks to the Eric Grid Consortium for inviting us to to this uh, workshop. Um, um, and our colleague from NTUA, especially uh, Panos uh, Anarchisti, for their hospitality, support, and technical discussion. It is a great pleasure uh, presenting our project uh, in collaboration with uh, with them in this, uh, let's say, technical session. Okay. Uh, so please, uh, next uh, from this. So uh, this is the plan of the presentation. First, uh, some some words uh, about us and and why do we apply for for Eric Grid? And then the technical part of the project will be presented by my colleague uh, Francisco Jesus Matas Díaz. So uh, about us, uh, we are the Power Engineering Group of the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University University of Sevilla, where the main investigator is uh, Professor Antonio Gomez Esposito. He's leading and, and steadily growing uh, from 80s. Uh, for instance, in the last uh, three years, we published more than 100 journal uh, paper uh, for a total of, of about 500 uh, in the group. We are currently 26 members, uh, uh, all of them PhD. Uh, 19 of us, we are uh, between associate and assistant professor, and, and seven are full, full professor. In addition, we have a PhD program in comparison with uh, three of the most important universities in Spain, uh, UPSC in Catalonia, uh, the University of Basque Country and the University of Malaga. Uh, in the case of Sevilla, we have uh, 10 PhD, stu 10 PhD students uh, making, making uh, their PhD with, uh, with us. 
Uh, with respect to the research, development and transfer project, uh, we have a strong link with industry uh, and, and utility, uh, especially uh, with Endesa, which is the, the, the major utility in the south of, uh, of Spain. And finally, in some professor in 2012, uh, they created uh, a spin-off called Ingelectus, uh, for supporting uh, industry uh, and the electri electricity sector uh, in a closer manner uh, from from the from the power engineering group. Okay, so next. Um, with respect to our laboratory facility and experience, uh, we have two scale down distribution network uh, emulating one a, a medium voltage network, another one a low voltage and the other one, a low voltage uh, distribution network, where we usually validate new devices and controller, both from power system level and from local device level. We have more than 20 power converters designed by us with different rated powers, uh, rated voltage topology, uh, control mode, etc., which are connected to, to the scale, to the different buses of the scale town network in order to emulate uh, renewable energy sources to provide uh, ancillary services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and in addition, some of them has uh, supercapacitor and energy and battery uh, energy storage system uh, connected into into the DC bus of the converter in order to provide, for instance, energy response or power smoothing, etc. Uh, moreover, we have uh, two ACDC programming sources with uh, with uh, power with uh, with um, power amplifier functionality and several real-time real simulator provided by Speedcode, OpenRT, or Typhoon here for real-time simulation, control hardware in the loop, or, or, or rapid prototyping. Uh, however, in, in our laboratory, uh, we didn't have any experience with uh, power hardware in the loop, and we consider uh, this is a fundamental technique uh, for validating new prototypes or controller before implementing them in our physical scale down network. This was our main motivation for applying to Eurigrid 2.0 and contact with our friends of uh, NTUA, uh, which are an expert in, in power hardware in the loop. Okay, so uh, now. Uh, my colleague uh, Francisco uh, will continue with the technical part of the project. So, Frank, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Manolo. I hope uh, it's audible. Hello, everyone. I'm Francisco. I'll be in charge of presenting the technical part. So, let me begin with a brief introduction to the topic, followed by an overview of the controller we've been working on. And finally, I'll show you some interesting results. Well, okay. Nowadays, uh, political and industrial efforts are all pointing to the same goal, the decarbonization of the electrical system. Since most renewable energy sources are converted interfaced, the new power system will be characterized by a reduced inertia, and the new generators will have to cope with a more complex frequency control, among other issues. Virtual inertia must be provided to reinforce frequency stability, the volatility of the renewable primary resources should be smoothed, Voltage levels and harmonic generation must be kept under control. All these new functionalities are the so-called ancillary services, and the inverters are the perfect tool to provide them, thanks to their versatility and their speed. So, the lack of synchronous generators, along with the necessity of these new functionalities, have inevitably changed our vision towards the control of inverters. And this is when the grid former emerged. When we think about these issues, we immediately tend to think in three-phase distribution networks, especially low-voltage networks and microgrids. And we are not wrong. Indeed, uh, this type of network take the, work part, the worst part when there is a high penetration of uh, renewable energies and power electronics. But we also tend to think in three-phase solutions for three-phase systems. When we started working with our colleagues from NTUA, we realized that, yes, of course, we have a lot of three-phase generators, consumers and prosumers, but the, re the reality is that we also have a bunch of single-phase generators, consumers and prosumers, that can provide support to those ancillary services and are waiting to be exploited. 
and for sure we're going to need them. Think, for example, in a single phase microgrid like this one. If a uh, contingency takes place near the connection to the main grid, the protection tree, and this microgrid become my landed, if we want to avoid the blackout, we will need a grid forming unit there. Furthermore, if we had add that grid forming unit, the protection might not have tripped in the first place. So taking all of this into consideration, during our stay, we worked on a single phase grid forming controller based on a virtual synchronous generator. And we believe that power hard model in the loop is a magnificent tool to explore all the potential benefits that this type of controllers can bring to the power system. So let's continue with an overview of the controller. As you can see in this slide, uh, it shows a cascaded topology where the upper layers generate the set points for the following layer. We see characterized by a faster dynamic. Uh, this way, the control zero will be the pulse with modulation. The duty cycle is generated by a current controller, which in turn receive the current references for, from a voltage controller. In the literature, usually uh, these three layers are grouped together and called inner control loops. The outer control loops will be the virtual synchronous generator, control three, and the primary and secondary controller that helps the frequency to converge to the nominal, to the nominal value. Well, before selecting the most suitable controller for each layer, it's necessary to define a reference frame. The first option is the, to work with the sinusoidal voltage and current magnitudes. That is a stationary reference frame. And for instance, we will and, and we need will need a proportional resonant controller in the voltage and current layers. There is a there is a catch here. Uh, unlike three phase system, in single phase systems, the instantaneous power is sinusoidal and it cannot be directly fed to a virtual synchronous generator. So it, a low pass filter is necessary to retain only the DC component of that instantaneous power, which corresponds to the instantaneous active power. This low bandwidth low pass filter will directly affect to the dynamic response of the full control. There is a second option which is to work with a virtual three-phase system. Now, it may sound like killing flies with a sledgehammer, but the truth is that it has uh, some interesting advantages. For example, we can work in a rotating reference frame where the instantaneous magnitudes are now constant DC values. So we can implement simple PIs in the voltage and current controller. The other great advantage, is that now in a three-phase system, the power is constant and it can be directly fed to the virtual synchronous generator. During our stay, we took both options. We went to the experimental test bed and via experimental test, we compared them and saw the advantages and drawbacks of each uh, reference frame. So let's proceed with experimental tests. Uh, we started uh, working in an Icelandic, Icelandic mode. Here you can see a, a particularization of the controller for each reference frame. In the lower plot, you can see how the virtual three-phase system is created. The alpha component corresponds to the original measurement, and the virtual beta component is generated by means of two cascaded low-pass filters. Both alpha, both alpha and beta component are later transferred to the DQ domain through the classical park transformation. Regarding the experimental test bed, uh, we used the three phase unit available in the, in the NTUA lab. It was set up to operate as a single phase device. It was powered by a battery energy system, and the output of the inverter was connected to a resistive load. The test procedure took advantage of the cascaded structure of the controller. I mean, uh, each layer can be tested separately and protections and software limitations can be added to each layer. This way, these, uh, the, these are the results from the inner loops. You can see that the response are quite similar in terms of speed and power quality. Here you can see, for example, the transient of the virtual three-phase system in the DQ domain. 
At this point, we decided to stop for a moment before continuing with the virtual synchronous generator. Uh, why? Well, uh, due some due some due to some technical limitation, we were working at a nominal power much lower than three phase rotted power. This, together with the dead time configuration for the pulses for the actual switching frequency, significantly impoverished the power quality. In Sevilla, we had experience in previous research uh, with power quality, so we decided to add an active motor filtering functionality to the inner loops. This way, we were able to reduce almost five times the total harmonic distortion of the output of the controller. So we ended up working with an additional ancillary service that wasn't part of the plan, but it worked well, so we were really happy. The following results are the response of the full controller. Uh, the set point is the, the amplitude of the electromotive force of the virtual synchronous generator. A volt, uh, step on the voltage across the, uh, the resistive load also means a step on the power delivered by the inverter that is directly translated in a perturbation on the frequency of the virtual machine. The most interesting result here is the difference in terms of frequency between both reference frames, while in terms of voltage response and active power response is quite similar. The reason behind this is still unknown. We still need to carry out uh, a more detailed analysis of the dynamics of the system. Once finished the, the test uh, with the Icelandic system, we proceeded to the grid connected mode. On the beginning, we started working on simulation and control hardware in the loop in both reference frames. However, we found that the system tended to instability in the stationary reference frame. We tried some different gain combinations, different damping methods, but still couldn't find a suitable solution. So we left that option in a standby and we proceeded with the rotating reference frame. Now the three phase unit is connected to, the, to a power amplifier. So the power filter was changed to an LCL configuration and the PI on the voltage controller was, was replaced by a virtual impedance. The experimental setup consists of a power hardware in the loop setup following the ideal transformer architecture. The power amplifier receives the set points from RTDS, where the rest of the circuit is simulated. The first step was working with a fixed set AC source we performed some uh, ramp transients on the frequency in order to measure the virtual inertia provided by the grid formula. The following test was adding a droop to the AC source in order to have a grid that is sensitive to changes in the load of the system. Additionally, we added a load with a switch in the software side to be able to perform that transient and this way quantify the, the influence of the virtual inertia, primary frequency response, etc. These are some results uh, regarding the disconnected mode operation. The first, uh, the upper plots shows the constant row of test. The, here in the left plot, you can see the inertia response of the controller. The inertia constant is a design parameter of the virtual synchronous generator. It was calculated in order to not exceed the maximum rated power of one kilowatt of the power amplifier. The second plot shows the transients on the on the load uh, at the software side. We found an underdamped response, uh, so it would require a fine tuning from a sensitivity analysis. And it will also be interesting to see how the power hardware in the loop setup affects to those results in order to exploit the, the potential of this of this loop. So I don't want to, to take up much more time. As you can see, we did a, a good variety of tests during our stay. From uh, the Iceland mode results, we sent a paper to the set conference uh, this year in, in Mugla, Turkey. I wasn't able to travel myself, but Alkisti did a fantastic job presenting our results. Uh, we also worked on power hardware in the loop with grid connected mode. 
we learn a lot from our colleagues from NTUA uh, about this uh, emerging testing tool. And uh, we feel lucky uh, because fortunately we found out that there is a lot of things to explore yet <laughs> and to continue our collaborations in dynamic analysis, experimental tests such as Black Start, ice landing and synchronization of microgrids, uh, emulating more complex grids in RTDS. So that's all from my side. Thank you once again to Erigrid, to our colleagues from NTA for making possible and give us uh, this opportunity. And that's all. Uh, don't hesitate to make questions and thank you. Thank you, Manuel and Francisco, for a very nice overview. And great to hear that you uh, that your um, access uh, project was, was very successful. Yeah, we have uh, maybe time for one short question. So we have one from David. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. A general question, do you have any idea about how the share of single phase versus three phase devices is developing? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't I didn't hear well. I'm going to Okay, uh, I repeat it. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. A general question, do you have any idea uh, about how the share of single phase versus three phase devices is developing? Uh, I don't know exactly the numbers, uh, but it's true that for uh, one interesting presentation that we had was uh, during uh, my stay in Athens and was a presentation of uh, Professor Ochoa from Melbourne University that talked about the single phase devices in Australia. And it's amazing how the um, there is a huge uh, um, quantity of single phase device in a grid. And of course, when when you, for example, in Spain, uh, every consumer have access to, to, the, to the PV installations or battery storage system, but everything is in single phase. These are single phase devices. Three phase installations uh, in, in Spain are disappearing. Uh, at least at, at consumer level. So I think in low voltage uh, networks and, and microgrids, the single phase uh, system will completely dominate the, the three phase systems. But three phase system will be also really important for uh, generators or consumers of higher power uh, or in the medium voltage networks. I don't know if I answered the question. Thanks, uh, Francisco. I think yes. <laughs> uh, and we get also a thumbs up. So I uh, will hand over to uh, Emilio, who will introduce our next speaker. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Tomas. Yes, so we are moving then now from Spain to Switzerland, where Matteo Barsanti from the Col Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne uh, will be presenting the project uh, coordinating residential flexibility resources in a socio-technical co-simulation design. So this COFLEX, so-called COFLEX uh, project was implemented at the CESA lab in office in Germany. So Matteo, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you clearly hear me? Yeah. Yes, very well. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Yeah. So uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today to present a bit like a summary of uh, what uh, I did together with uh, Jan Schwarz from the office lab in, in Oldenburg uh, during my two weeks um, lab access uh, in uh, last June. Um, before explaining or summarizing what we did in the COFLEX project, I would like to, to spend a bit of time uh, to giving a bit of context uh, where this project is coming from and a bit of my profile. So I'm a, I'm a PhD candidate at the fourth year, uh, hopefully the, the last one. And within my PhD, I studied, um, I was interested in understanding how to improve the way we model energy demand, residential energy demand, looking at uh, data-driven methods that are inspired by social science uh, insights and, and theory. Um, so what uh, I was specifically interested in uh, improving the way we model energy demand intensity and temporality and how this can better inform uh, policy and intervention in terms of uh, distribution grid planning and, and operation. Um, so, um, and mo let's say most of the, yeah, 
So uh, most of the, for the first three years of my project, of my PhD, I've been, I had the opportunity to work within the MOMENT project, uh, which stands for modeling the socio-technical multi-level architecture of the energy system and its transformation. And within this project, we focus on developing a tool that can support uh, policy design, looking at different dimension of the, of the energy, of the transformation of the, of the energy system, both technical and social. And specifically, what we did is to develop a co-simulation design where we couple models from different domains, from the residential sector, from the industrial sector, from the grid, in order to explore uh, co-evolution dynamics. We know the energy system is more and more interconnected, and uh, it's important to understand how the different components of the energy system influence each other in this uh, evolution, in this transition. And specifically, my focus uh, was on uh, modeling energy demand and flexibility. So, uh, within uh, this time, what I've been focusing on is to develop uh, the mod, which is a, a model developed in Python for um, that adopt um, a time use based approach. So in practice, what um, what I, what this model does is that it uses time use data, which are large scale collection of uh, uh, self reported diaries of um, uh, activity segments performed by individual um, members of an household, so uh, either sleeping, cooking, cleaning, and so on, and then generates in a stochastic way uh, these activity segments and then link the activities. Uh, so from these activity segments, that reconstruct uh, the load curve of a given household with a high uh, temporal resolution. So here you can see like a typical activity sequence and then how the different, uh, the use, the switch on and off events for different appliances is, uh, is generated. Um, so what we did in, in the project, in the previous project, in my project, we coupled this model with uh, other complementary models like the electric grid, uh, different distributed energy resources. Uh, uh, we also investigated uh, the, consumer behavior in terms of adoption of different technology. And we were also, let's say, part of it was to uh, develop a tool for simulating the response, also response to different demand response signals. So this is, let's say, the, a work in progress. So at the same time, we realized that in order to uh, assess the flexibility potential of the residential sector, we need also a tool uh, that can aggregate and coordinate the flexibility that comes from the uh, from the residential sector. So for this reason, um, together with um, Jan, we decided to apply for the uh, to the Ergid project, and uh, with um, with the idea of uh, developing a tool that can um, analyze in a reproducible uh, way and also multidimensional way uh, residential demand flexibility, and through a co-simulation co approach. And um, in particular, we are what we want. We want to do what we want to do is to develop a tool that can be not can be used for comparing different way of simulating energy demand, and also can be used for comparing different uh, flexibility aggregation and coordination strategy. So the starting point was, um, I'd say, this energy demand model coupled with Mosaic. And as a first objective, we uh, develop CoFlex, uh, which is a model for. Uh, I will show you later for uh, aggregating flexibility. The second objective was to couple CoFlex with the mode through Mosaic. And third, we, we test the, the scalability and uh, the operation of, of such a co simulation design in uh, according to different type of demand response mechanism. I want to specify that we are, we are not really interested in, assess in assessing the final uh, flexibility potential, but more the, the suitability of this tool for such kind of application. Let's say that the, the flexibility potential will be a next step, a follow up, uh, potentially follow up project. So uh, regarding the first objective, the model design uh, COFLEX, uh, we decide to organize it according to uh, two main uh, modules. The first one, so uh, this, uh, let's say, model takes in inputs, any, any type of input can be time series for load, supply, electricity price, emission, whatever is important for um, an aggregator or, or can be given as input to a local uh, energy market. Um, based on this input, the first component, let's say, assess as the, um, let's say, the task of assessing the flexi flexibility requirements in terms of volume and in terms of uh, timing of the flexibility needed according to a predefined objective that can be reduced peak load um, and so on. 
or solve congestion and so on. And then, and this can be done at the aggregated level or individually for each uh, flexible consumers or, or unit. Um, and then, based on the res output of this first component, we have the second component, the se second module that uh, we call it demand side management incentive definition. So we estimate the level and timing of demand response signals and the target consumers in order to uh, mobilize uh, the flexibility that is needed by the, by the system. And this can be done through two different types of signals, implicit like dynamic pricing or explicit like direct load control. So these two components behave like a wrapper and we can, so let's say that they manage the, the, the data uh, inputs and, and outputs and, and the coupling. And then what we can do, I mean, we made available a list of all possible rules that can that can be used for uh, performing these two tasks. And the combination of rules in the end results in a, in, a, um, in the strategy or the, mech the flexibility mechanism. And of course, the idea is that we can add uh, later on different rules and we can test these, these new rules. And of course, the output of, of the flexibility aggregator is can be electricity price, demand, uh, uh, direct load control signals, rebates, feedbacks for, for the user. And so the, the, the energy demand and flexibility model will take this in input in order then to adapt the, um, the behavior of the consumer, simulate how the, the consumer will, will respond to it. So uh, how we did the, the model coupling, we used the mode for simulating energy demand and also like a component for a weather simulation based on historical data. We also included a model for simulating PV just to uh, show how the, the how flexible is this co simulation design, and then using a building function building module of uh, of mosaic, which managed to which allowed to aggregate data and um, uh, uh, generate the right format for Copflex. So change in this case change the time resolution. Uh, so aggregate over time, then we we couple it with Coflex that uh, does the perform the flexibility query estimation and the incentive definition, and then uh, send the uh, demand response or demand side management stimuli back to to the mode to the flexibility the load shift uh, for implementing load shifting. So this is somehow the, the cycle. And and third, what we did is to uh, define for for scenario for different demand response mechanisms. Uh, how what we did is that we we try to um, cover the um, the let's say uh, as as much as possible as wide as possible different uh, typology of a uh, mechanism. So we combine a um, community level, aggregated level, and uh, individual level flexibility requirement estimation with explicit or implicit incentive. So we end up with four scenario: community level explicit. Uh, individual level explicit, community level implicit, and individual uh, level implicit. So in practice, uh, when we have, um, for instance, let's say scenario A, it means that the flexibility requirement estimator assessed the flexibility needed at for the level of the, the entire um, group of consumers or the entire grid, and then uh, send signals for periods of force load shift. And uh, let's say the, um, on the demand side, uh, these uh, these signals are received and then are translated into automatically delay the run of a of an appliance by two hours. Uh, while in, in the case of right proportional rule, uh, it's that they similar, but let's say the the user is meant to optimize the to to choose the optimal shift according to these uh, signals in order to minimize running cost. So uh, the baseline low profile, what we did is, since we were not really interested in assessing the final uh, flexibility, but more the, the, the amount of flexibility that can be extracted, but more on the operation of, of the, the co-simulation co design that we were proposing, what we did is we uh, analyzed only the load for um, wet appliances. So you see here the so dishwasher and washing machine. So here, here you see the, the three uh, typical peaks for these two appliances. And uh, the reason why is also because these two appliances are are meant to be at least excluding eating and uh, electric vehicle charging. Those are the appliances that that can uh, deliver uh, the highest uh, flexibility within uh, domestic environment. Uh, so we we introduce uh, we have here um, let's say the the scenario where we are not uh, applying any demand response signals. We have uh, the load the total load in. Um, 
the average load in blue, in orange, the PV supply, and in green, the, the net load. And then we applied, we run the scenario depending on the different type of uh, flexibility mechanism. And uh, we can see that the type of, uh, these are the, let's say, the incentive, the signals that the, the user are receiving, the households are receiving depending on the scenario. So here are four heat map, and each cell of the heat pump is represented by households and the time step. So let's take, the, for instance, the first case, aggregated explicit, all the households are receiving the same signal at the same time between uh, six and eight in the, in the evening. And so when, if the household is expected to run the dishwasher, the washing machine at this time, uh, let's say the, they are forced to delay the, um, the, 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 the switch on uh, by two hours. Similarly, this is when it's aggregated, uh, it's done at the aggregated level, while at individual level, the signals uh, depends on, of course, on the profile of each, uh, of each user. And similarly, on the right side, uh, instead of uh, explicit, we have implicit incentives. So we have a, a signal that is uh, dynamic. And uh, we can see here uh, it's, it's negative. It means that uh, there is overproduction from PV. So the, the, the net load is negative. And so people are somehow incentivized to, to, to increase consumption during these hours while decrease in the evening when we have a um, higher peak in the, in the grid. Uh, so what, what, just to, to show that, let's say, the, the co-simulation design that we proposed was working as expected, we can see that the, in the end, the load curve is it's, uh, it's adapted uh, according to, let's say, to the signals that we were observing. So for instance, in the aggregated explicit scenario, the peak that we are observing here was uh, shifted to later in the evening. When we apply at the uh, individual level, the change is, is, is lower and is more distributed. While for uh, aggregated implicit uh, strategy, here we have, for instance, an increasing peak during midday in order to, let's say, consume uh, benefit from this uh, over generation from uh, surplus of generation from PV, and while what, if you apply it at an uh, individual level, let's say this change is, uh, is reduced. Uh, finally, we test the scalability of the solution, and uh, we have, let's say, good and a bad uh, news. The good news is that the, um, the solution seems to be uh, uh, performed in a good way with respect to increasing the, the simulated time, so the number of days that we are simulating. And here we are testing a number of 100 households, while with respect to the number of instances, so the number of households keeping, let's say, the simulation time uh, fixed to four days, the, um, let's say that the, um, the execution time increased in an exponential way, which means that um, there might be problem if we want to simulate really large scale scenario. Of course, due to the limited time of the of the project, we were not able to investigate further this aspect, but uh, potentially it would be interesting to understand if it's actually something that uh, belongs to the to the model itself or could be solved, changing the way we uh, we implement the model. And just to uh, conclude, briefly conclude, uh, the idea is to make this model uh, fully documented and open source because we want to apply for our, uh, let's say, we want to use it for our models, but also make it available for other researchers to, to test different type of uh, enrichment models uh, and also different uh, rules for coordinating uh, and aggregating flexibility. Uh, Mosaic, this co-simulation framework, offers uh, interesting uh, modules and features for, for simulating enrichment and for coordinating flexibility. The simulation, as I said before, the co-simulation co design had good scalability with respect to, do, to the duration of the scenario, but less um, so with respect to the number of instance. And, um, and also in terms of um, uh, possible uh, direction of future research will be interesting to, to, to make it to, um, to perform, to run scenario that are, let's say, representative and, um, and realistic. And in order to understand in, yeah, in, in then how much is the potential of flexibility that we can extract depending on the, the way we simulate flexibility and the way we uh, and which kind of strategy we, we adopt. So with that, I, I conclude and um, I thank you for the Aerigate project for uh, giving us the, um, this opportunity.
Thank you. Thank you, Mateo, for your excellent presentation. It looks a very comprehensive uh, work, actually. OK, so some time very, very fast for some questions. Maybe just a quick comment from my side as well. So uh, um, you, you have explained very clearly the, the interaction of the aggregator, let's say, downwards uh, uh, with, with, the, with the different resources, flexible resources, and how to activate them and so on. What about upwards? I mean, the interaction of the aggregator with the electricity market in case this aggregator is going to participate in some of the, let's say, auxiliary markets or energy markets. Uh, is it probably is that uh, a little bit, uh, let's say, uh, out of the scope of this uh, access in any grid, but is within the scope of the overall project of this so-called moment or so. Yeah, just just for confirmation. Yeah, and thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, I think that um, so that the, um, the design that we provide here, uh, we propose here, is actually quite flexible. So the inputs can come from let's say bottom up, from individual units, individual consumers, but also uh, top down from from the from the market. Uh, so from that sense, uh, any type of input can be can be given to the um, to this um, as a model in order to assess the flexibility requirements and then how to activate it. So for instance, the price that uh, from the spot market or uh, or uh, a request for ancillary service at uh, a trans uh, transmission uh, grid level. Um, the what I see, let's say, the limitation for the moment, but could be actually uh, developed further, is potentially like a, a bidding process where, let's say, the um, where there are, are performed some iteration between uh, different agents. That's for the moment has not has not been implemented, but uh, potentially could be like a further uh, direction for further uh, development. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Matteo, for that. We have another yeah. question. In the yeah, sorry, Tom. Yeah, we have another question in the uh, yeah. in the Q and A. Which algorithm is used to aggregate the flexibility? Did you aggregate flexibility at the device level or at network level, or ex for example, the flexibility of the whole distribution network? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. So um, actually, it can be uh, applied any level. Uh, it depends on how the the inputs are provided. Uh, the flexibility can be aggregated uh, at the level of individual households or at the level of a uh, energy community or at the, a district level, this is completely flexible. So in our case, we were considering when, when I was uh, here, aggregated level, individual level, the individual level is the level of one individual household, while aggregated level is a group of households. But then we can also aggregate between different group of households for its or different group of, of, of consumers. They can be industrial, residential, commercial, uh, in, uh, in this way, we can apply different rules depending on the on the type of users, because maybe we want to uh, incentivize more the activation of industrial flexibility rather than uh, residential or prior prioritize uh, the time where we uh, access flexibility from different consumers. That can be actually quite interesting. Um, or even the, the, the synergy between uh, commercial, uh, the flexibility from commercial sector and uh, industrial and, uh, and residential. I hope I answered the, the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Yes. OK, Thomas, back to you for presenting the last uh, presentation. Many thanks, uh, Matteo, uh, and also Emilio. Let's come to our last uh, technical presentation. It's given by uh, Hybert uh, from the Dickel University uh, in uh, Turkey, and he will uh, talk about intelligent, intelligent control of uh, enhanced power smoothing for the uh, based microgrids. So, Hybert, uh, the floor is yours. I hope you can share your screen. Uh, please unmute uh, your microphone and go ahead with your presentation. Uh, hello. Can you hear you? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you, okay. but not very loud, but uh, I think it's okay. And we see also your presentation. So please go ahead. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, in uh, the project, 
for communities intelligent control and power smoothing of federal based microgrid. Uh, in that presentation, I mentioned a lot that part of our proposal that we implement in the uh, CRES uh, in Greece. And thanks uh, for the grid to provide that uh, to people implement this uh, proposal. I'm Mehmet Koç, I'm the University of Turkey. And, uh, this is uh, this in, here in the part of the project. We consider uh, IoT based load variation using demand side management. And uh, the demand side, as you know, is a concept that provides a viable and more efficient option to alter the net electricity consumption pattern without bringing much discomfort to, discomfort to the consumer. With the development of the control and the information technology, uh, the residential community provides a new potential demand side management and due to the uh, distribution utilities to optimize the load profile. In this project, we focus the opportunity associated with uh, solar uh, photovoltaics integrated uh, distributed um, residential consumer. And with demand side managers are aim to minimize the gap between the target and actual load profile are investigated. And a lot deeper of uh, general DC model to shift the operation of not so critical residential appliance along with the optimal energy disbursement from the residential consumer side. Battery storage also is implemented uh, in here. Uh, in the first figure, uh, we have uh, uh, hardware parts. In hardware parts, we have a PV system and the loads. Uh, now critical loads and uh, also uh, we implement battery system in MATLAB swimming and also critical loads are in there. Our controller is implemented at uh, ESP32 uh, controller and uh, communicate with both hardware parts and the uh, simulation part with uh, IoT based MQTT server. The, this is the hardware implementation of the load and the PV system. And this in the left up side, we have non critical loads. Is, these are um, resistive loads we consider as the resistive loads. We have connection, connection relay buffs to uh, deploy on the uh, loads according to DCM management. And we have our controllers, and also uh, we use a PV emulator and love the interface that uh, emulate a DC power supply as a PV system. And as we mentioned, with the IoT based uh, MQQT server, we connect all this hardware and software. This in this uh, figure, in the upside, we have uh, DC programmable DC power supply, which uh, emulate the PV system, and the uh, downside are not VIV interfaces to uh, provide this emulation uh, of PV system. This is our uh, non critical load parameters. Uh, we have six non critical loads. And all this are the battery uh, which is uh, implemented in MATLAB swimming. And then uh, in our uh, method, uh, consider the case of grid connect distribution to the compass, the commercial, industrial, and residential uh, consumer having solar photovoltaic generation as well. To smooth the mismatch between the net uh, predictive load and the net actual power, draw two types of the load, the time shiftable loads, and the uh, battery system are considered for demand response. 
project. Uh, the centralized control has been assumed for the uh, demand response activation. The objective function for this optimization is in given one. Here, uh, P, uh, A, and P, F are predictable load and the net of shared respectively during time interval T. And these are uh, calculated in uh, equation 2R3, respectively. Here, uh, P load and PPV are uh, forecasted load and forecasted uh, PV generation, respectively, during the time, whereas the PV load and PPV are the actual load and actual PV generation power. The application of the demand response modified in two ways. Increase the demand response or the decrease of the demand response. The modifications are computed in the uh, four and five here. Uh, BC and BD represent the total incremental and decremental by the uh, battery storage system charging and discharging. The variable S on and S off represent the total and incremental decrement and in, increment and decrement by the switch on off different devices. Uh, the output uh, power of the power panel is computed from the forecasted solar irradiation de data in the equation six. Available minutes wise solar radiation forecast data is used to simulate the power output of the solar PV panel by computing the average PV output over the 15 minutes time slots. Where the PV output power is the PV system, uh, PV system output, PV rate PV present the equivalent power of the rating of the PV. Balance uh, F denotes the forecast value of the solar ir irradiance in watt uh, per meter square, and Fs denotes the solar irradiance under the standard condition, and this value is the 1000 uh, watt per uh, meter square. And the solar irradiation point has been assumed as 300. On the operation of the non critical loads and the uh, power exchange with TBS and battery storage system. Loads are programmed in the real time by central control to that the difference between target and action and fraction is minimized. The non critical loads here aim to drive increase the cost and consumer demand response engagement. This is achieved by the Concentrating the optimization, uh, optimization algorithm uh, to schedule the non critical devices to run within the specific time. In addition, discharge level and discharge rates must be within specific limits necessary to provide uh, different, different loads and uh, battery. System loading and unloading control used in the optimization process. The battery system is modeled as the follow used in the most appropriate way in terms of energy supplies, in where E0 is the initial battery charge and B is the battery terminal voltage and the I is the battery current. A total uh, the current value of the battery energy is required to estimate the battery state of charge approximately. Uh, appropriately. Uh, the battery state of charge can be expressed in, uh, as equation 8, where the VS is the supply voltage, PV is the power supplied by the uh, battery energy storage system. And um, B is the round trip efficiency of the batteries. And the battery round trip efficiency is calculated in the equation that in the, uh, where Nub is and Nub is and uh, Nub. These are the BSS charging and discharging efficiency respectively. 
in DSS operations and constraints as followed in equation. And in 11, the state of charge should be in the maximum and minimum charge holding capacity limits. This can be presented in that, where state of charge is the minimum limit of the battery discharge and the state of charge mass is the maximum charge holding in the capacity of the battery. The maximum value of the battery this uh, charge and discharge power during any time short is given in 11, where EB max is the maximum available battery current. And the uh, under aggregated estimated load profile and the derived from predicted load profile and the estimated periodization variation. And similarly, the aggregated actual load profile was calculated from the actual period variation and the actual load demand from mm, and figure four and figure five. And this is the uh, first in this first scenario, the effectiveness of the load different demanders first program in the reduction of the total load profile mismatch from the predictive load profile analyzer. The results show in figure six that there's a small improvement in the overall deviation of actual load profile from the predict predicted load pattern, considering only the load delay demand response strategy. In this uh, second scenario, it's assuming to 60% of the total residential consumer uh, battery storage system participate in the demand response program. The simulation results shown in this figure, uh, and the deviation can be greatly reduced with the control and the charge discharge of the battery. Almost all peak uh, are reduced, and in other than the uh, fluctuation are greatly reduced, however, an additional divergence peak is created at uh, between uh, six time intervals 60 and uh, 70. The result revealed that the overall load deviation in between 70 and uh, 100 is reduced to almost zero. In this case, the non compliance or non critical loss are calculated to put a load for the whole day while reduced by the 60%. In the last scenario, uh, the efficiency of both uh, batteries for uh, storage system and load delay absolutely acting together on the most mismatch is under investigation in that case. It's shown in figure A that the implementation of both demand response programs further improved the result. Total division are reduced almost to zero in the time interval between uh, 40 and uh, 80. It's also flattened in the range of uh, 30 and uh, 50, although uh, new divergence peaks are created previous. Summary was removed in that case. Thanks for your attention. I'm listening to the most important part. Thanks, Robert, for the uh, overview of your interesting uh, project. Uh, do we have uh, any questions? Uh, there is one, the role of the IoT in uh, uh, demand response application is quite interesting. Uh, oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> this was only a comment. Uh, good. And since we have no questions, then thanks again for your presentation. And since we are already uh, now pretty uh, good in time, but to finish the, the workshop uh, on time. Uh, we move on to the last part, uh, which is the summary uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, conclusions uh, that will be presented by Ibrahim from the University of Strathclyde. He's one of our work package leaders that is responsible for the implementation of the TA projects together with Santiago Sanchez from Sintef. So, uh, Ibrahim, the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Ibrahim, we cannot hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Oh, no. Yeah, it's working. Oh, excellent. So please go ahead. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Thomas. So first of all, I'd like to thank all the presenters uh, for their excellent presentations and sharing their uh, interesting work, which was facilitated by the Eric Ritt, uh to Transnational Access Program. And also like to thank the participants who listened in and also contributed in terms of questions. Um, so we've heard quite uh, a lot of interesting information uh, from the uh, user groups. Uh, we've heard about experiences uh, ranging from the impact of cybersecurity vulnerabilities on power system stability. Uh, there was also quite a lot of focus on control scheme validation, uh, whether it's related to microgrids or facilitating flexibility markets. Uh, there was also interesting work about uh, algorithm validation and data collected using uh, the, the experiments that were described. Um, it's also important to highlight uh, the that most of these projects had made use of the lab facilities, in particular hardware in the loop and co-simulation uh, that's offered by the Ericrid, uh lab facilities. So in terms of uh, what we've achieved so far uh, in as part of the AeroGrid Transnational Access Program. So we've concluded uh, about 50 projects thus far uh, with international uh, user groups. Um, and that translates to effectively about 770 access days in total uh, since the program started uh, in 2020. Uh, so as you've seen from the quality of the presentation so far, uh, we've got a wide range of uh, interesting projects uh, that also span industry as well as academic or research organizations. A lot of the outcomes so far uh, will have been published in uh, journal or conference papers. You'll also find more information in terms of technical reports on the AeroGrid website. Uh, at a later date. Uh, and I think it's also clear that the program has provided an excellent facility for uh, the user groups to advance the TRL of their uh, respective IP, uh, whether it's early term research or, or TRL that's a little bit more advanced in terms of lab demonstrations. Um, so, as I said, also I wanted to emphasize again that there is an opportunity to make use of the state of the art facilities, part of the TA program uh, of the AeroGrid project. Um, and the capabilities of these facilities is wide ranging uh, in terms of uh, whether it's simulators uh, or physical components that could be used for the purposes of component device or systems testing and validation. Um, so how do you apply to the AeroGrid access scheme? Uh, if you don't know already, please go and to the website, visit the website. Uh, they've got a link here. So that's aerogrid2.eu forward slash lab access. You will find all the information related to the access program, including uh, the sort of conditions, eligibility, as well as descriptions of the lab facilities. There is currently about 21 lab facilities uh, that are offering free access uh, to user groups. Uh, you can also contact the labs directly for any clarifications if you're not sure uh, whether your application uh, or, or proposal would fit uh, in the respective lab. Um, in terms of the process of application, again, all information will be is available on the Ericrid website. In terms of the process, uh, there is uh, the proposal template as well, which is fairly straightforward to complete, uh, as well as a link to the submission platform. Uh, so we use uh, Conf tool 
which you probably be familiar with as part of if you have uh, submitted papers to a conference. So all submissions are administered via the ConfTool platform and the submissions will be assessed by an independent um, selection panel uh, that looks at the quality of the proposals and the applicants will be informed about the decision of uh, their application uh, in, in due course. So in terms of, uh, yeah, so that's the kind of conf tool login. So in terms of the access um, uh, calls, so we've been running uh, calls since the beginning of the project uh, back in 2020. So now we are currently uh, on the last call for the project, uh, which is currently open. So we're on the 10th call and we're accepting applications until uh, the end of this year. Uh, so please make use of um, uh, this opportunity. Um, it is a possibility that we may have additional calls after this one. Uh, but please do not sort of wait uh, for that possibility and, and make use of uh, the current live call. Uh, and if you have any questions, again, please reach out uh, via the website, um, as well as to any of the organizers here on the calls, or there's Thomas, uh, Emilio, uh, as well as myself. Uh, you can find the contact details here on the slide and also my colleague, uh, from Center of Energy Research, Santiago. Um, so again, thanks very much all for your participation uh, and listening to the presentations. And I'm really hope, looking forward to uh, your applications uh, for more access projects. Um, we will also be looking to organize a second user workshop uh, sometime next year. So please stay tuned to further announcements associated with the AgriGrid Transnational Access Program. So thanks very much, everyone, and have a good rest of your day and the weekend when it comes.